I just wanted to um, uh, say uh, a couple very quick words um, that I failed to mention earlier on, uh, which is that um, it's, it's, a, it's an especial uh, treat for me to uh, have uh, Joquinaldo Ferreira here um, because Joquinaldo and I have actually known each other for quite some time, about 15 years or so, when we were both uh, in Lisbon doing uh, research for our respective doctoral uh, dissertations. And um, it's been a, really, a real treat for me to follow his career um, and to uh, see that we have both, within about a month of each other, um, ended up in the same uh, umbrella institution of Brown University. So um, it's on a personal level as well, Hoki, that, uh, that I'm thrilled to be able to welcome you to the JCB. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce uh, Jim Green, who is a professor in the Department of History and Portuguese and Brazilian Studies, and also director of the Brazil Initiative here at Brown, who's going to introduce Hoki Naldo. I think this evening is, a, is an evening of people coming and going and slipping in and out of trains. And I'm one of the people who's going to have to slip out because I have to go to New York to go to Brazil tomorrow. So uh, I already have apologized to our speaker that I won't be able to hear his entire presentation. But it is a great honor as a member of the Department of Portuguese and Brazilian Studies and of uh, the History Department and the person who uh, was given the task of uh, chairing the search committee that identified the outstanding candidate that we were able to hire, Joaquin Alda Ferreira, to be able to introduce him tonight in this important lecture. Uh, and we refer to Joaquin Aldo in the, as his first name because that's a tradition, at least in Brazil. I'm not sure if that's the same in Portugal, but it's a, it's a term of endearment and, and respect. Joaquin uh, Aldo Ferreira received his PhD in African history from UCLA in 2003, and prior to that, he did his uh, undergraduate work at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro and his master's there. He specializes in African, colonial, Brazilian, and Atlantic histories. He is also interested in comparative slavery, forced labor, race relations and colonial societies, production of racial ideologies, and abolitionism. His scholarship has been funded by the National Endowment of the Humanities, the American Council of Learned Societies, the Bra uh, Brazilian Conselho Nacional de Desenvolvimento Científico e Tecnológico, and the Portuguese uh, Gil Banken Foundation. He has held residential fellowships at the W.E.B. Du Bois uh, uh, Institute for African and African American Research at Harvard University, the David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies at Harvard, and the Gilder Lehrman Center for the Study of Slavery, Resistance, and Abolition at Yale University. He is the author of Cross-Cultural Exchanges in the Atlantic World, Angola and Brazil During the Era of Slave Trade, published by Cambridge University Press in 2012, Dos Sertões ao Atlântico, Tráfico Ilegal de Escravos e Comércio Lícito em Angola, 1830-1860, published in Luanda in 2012. And he is completing a book provisionally entitled Pathways to Colonialism, Abolitionism, Territorial Sovereignty, and the Persistence of Unfree Labor in Angola, 1830-1880. In addition, he is at work on two book projects. One, a comparative sociocultural history of the 18th century Atlantic world, Brazil, the, uh, the, the Bight of Benin, the Gold Coast, and Angola, and a global microhistory of the Indian textile trade, the Cajeta da India, from the early 17th to the late 18th century. And in addition to the marvelous scholar that we have been very fortunate to have at Brown University, um, Hokinaldo is one of the gentlest and nicest and affable people, persons I know. And so it's a real great pleasure to have him here with us tonight. So is this working well? I think so. Let, let me just do this like this. Uh, first, let me say that I'm really you know, delighted to be here. And um, I appreciate the work that, you know, has been done to put this together. So I wanna say thanks to JCB Director Neil Safia, Professor Onesimo Maida, and Margot Nishimura. 
Um, and I also appreciated the, the opportunity to talk about Angola with the Portuguese ambassador, Nuno Brito, uh, the Angolan-born Portuguese ambassador, Nuno Brito, which is very interesting because some time ago, I was planning to ask the Angolan embassy, you know, if they could send someone here, and I contacted people in Angola. They said they would make it happen. It didn't happen. It was a little bit frustrating, but we did have a representative of Angola too. He was born in Angola and he was there for 15 years. So I'm, I'm, I'm very glad in a way that, that that did work out. A few months ago, when we decided that I was gonna give this lecture, and we did that in this beautiful and amazing Portuguese restaurant in East Providence, they have several of them there, the, the suggestion was that perhaps uh, I could use my book uh, as a basis for this presentation, this book that you know, came out two years ago. And I thought to myself, this is gonna be great because it means that you know, it simplifies everything, minimize, uh, minimizes stress, but of course I went back home and I realized that I had moved it on and that you know, my intellectual energy, so to speak, was elsewhere. More precisely, more specifically, in a book project dealing with the 19th century South Atlantic. Issues such as abolitionism, which for me here, and I should define this from, from the get-go, for me it really means the, the, the campaign to end the slave trade and the remaking of the Portuguese, of Portuguese colonialism at the time in the 19th century. The few people here who know my scholarship are familiar with the fact that I'm always very much interested in connections, connections across boundaries, connections ac across cultures, and, and that I work in terms of a, a framework, a frame of analysis that's very much Atlantic oriented. And uh, what I try to do in this new project is to extend this framework to, to the 19th century South Atlantic. I want to just show you uh, an image. Oops. It's gonna give you a sense of what I'm talking about here. So this is, it deals with the South Atlantic, meaning Angola and Brazil, but at the same time, it also deals with, you know, North America, Portugal, and Britain. It's very much uh, a part of this, you know, this context, this specific context in the, in the 19th century, when the, when the South Atlantic becomes very international. So, um, Having said that, the talk itself is organized in three sections. The first section deals with the context in which Portuguese abolitionism develops in the, in the South Atlantic. And the question that I ask here is actually quite simple. The question has to do with the specificity of the South Atlantic in the 19th century, vis-a-vis -vis the past. I'm interested in transformation as a social historian. So I use this very simple and straightforward question to outline two key features that, for me, make the South Atlantic in the 19th century a very unique place. The second section looks at the issue of abolitionism vis-a-vis -vis colonialism in the South Atlantic. The central argument here is that writing the history of abolitionism means writing, in many ways, the history of colonialism. The implication here is that we need to move away from the usual chronology of colonialism in Africa, which sees the Berlin Conference in 1885 as this foundational moment in the history of colonialism. Now, by saying that colonialism and abolitionism are very much intertwined, I'm not exactly breaking new ground. I wish I could claim that, but unfortunately that's not the case. There are several scholars out there who argue along the same line, 
particularly when they write, people who write about, you know, French colonialism in Africa, British colonialism in Africa. And I'm referring here to Africanists like Robin Law, um, Trevor Getz, and other people, a more recent scholarship that deals with colonialism, imperialism in the context of the expansion of slavery in the Atlantic in the 19th century. So I'm not alone here. What I try to pinpoint is that the Portuguese case is perhaps the best one to illustrate this connection, the very uh, tight connection between uh, abolitionism and colonialism. The third section of my talk makes the case for what I call a new social history of abolitionism in the South Atlantic. As we know, the scholarship of abolitionism, which is extremely insightful, with so many contributions and, and, and breakthroughs, emphasize these issues such as the state, kingdoms, the economy, elite formation, and international relations. Okay. We have had debates among Africanists going back many decades, dealing with the transition from the slave trade to the so-called licit commerce. The problem is that in this historiography, in this historiographical tradition, we hardly, if ever, talk about Africans. We don't really bring them into the picture. We are left with a faceless, with faceless processes, large-scale processes, in which local people are sometimes absent from their own history. And this, as you can imagine, is very frustrating from the point of view of a social historian. It's almost like there is some sort of invisible hand that works things on its own. It's difficult to relate to this historiography. My case for a new social history of abolitionism tries to push this historiography in a new direction, a new direction that accounts for the actions uh, of people, by people, who are usually seen as marginal in the context of the abolition of the slave trade, African people, ordinary African people. To illustrate this, uh, the possibilities of this approach, and there are several technicalities here. There are issues that relate to access to archives, to the use of different sources that we can talk about later. later. But to illustrate the possibilities of, of this type of interpretation, I will end this talk by analyzing the case of two runaway slaves. Okay. I'm going to use their names quite a bit. Okay. The first guy, his name is Egidio Sebastião. And the second one, the second Africa, is Antonio Joaquim. They're very important people okay, in this history. They are very important people because they are the people who, in 1854, go to the governor, to the Portuguese appointed governor of Benguela, the second largest city in Angola, to denounce the slave trade. And this denunciation of the slave trade is what brings or sets in motion an investigation that dis dismantles a slave trade network that you know, stretch it all the way from Central Africa to Cuba, Brazil, Lisbon, England, and the US. And you heard that right, the US, New York and Boston. My point is that by analyzing this specific incident in 1854, together with several other cases of slave resistance in Benguela in 1850s, we can ask new questions about Portuguese abolitionism. We would still be talking a lot about uh, the Portuguese state. We would talk about, you know, Portuguese officials. We would, we, 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 would, we would analyze the agency, which is what we've been doing for a long time now. But at the same time, we would account for the agency of local people. We would account for local dynamics and the ways that these local dynamics play into these very large-scale processes such as abolitionism and later colonialism. 
But before we get to the two Africans I was talking about before, the two runaway slaves, Egidio Sebastião and Antonio Joaquim, we need to step back and look at the broader context in which Portuguese abolitionism takes place in the South Atlantic in the 19th century. Let me begin by answering the question that I raised just a few minutes ago. The question, I want to remind you, was about the specificity of the South Atlantic in the, in the 19th century. There are at least two ways we can look at this question. There are two ways we can answer this question. The first, the first way is by pointing out that in the 19th century, the South Atlantic undeniably becomes the center of gravity of the transatlantic slave trade. And we have the picture there, we have the image that in, in a way it, it, it illustrates the, the importance of the South Atlantic in, in the context of the slave trade. It shows that half of the slave trade basically takes place in the South Atlantic, and more so than ever in the 19th century, for reasons that we can talk about later. Of course, the vast majority of the people affected by the slave trade come from Congo and Angola, as we can see there. Two areas under Portuguese influence. Angola had been a colony, a Portuguese colony, since the 17th century. We have cities, as we can see here. This is Luanda in the 18th century, mid 18th century. This is Luanda in the 19th century. So we have a Portuguese presence on the ground that it gives some specificity to the Portuguese case. In the 18th century, Luanda was probably the largest, together with Elmina probably, but the largest European, so to speak, city in Africa. In reality, in terms of social relations, it was mostly an African city. But there was a bureaucracy in place, a Portuguese bureaucracy in place, a colonial administration, sometimes a colonial administration that relies on local people. But the point is there was an administration there. There was a, a, a relationship that resembles the kind of colonialism that we, we find later on. And that's what gives specificity to the Portuguese case. Most of the people taken from Central Africa, taken from Angola, uh, brought to Brazil up until the 18th, 19th century. And from that point on, they are brought not only to Brazil, but also to Cuba. And again, in the 19th century, in the context, in a context in which the British had basically dropped out of the slave trade, in which the French slave trade is not that big, in this specific context, the slave trade is more than ever a Portuguese business, a Brazilian business. On the American side, scholars have argued that a new type of slavery emerges in the 19th century. We call that the second slavery, which is by no means an archaic institution. It's not an outdated or obsolete institution. In fact, it is an institution that at that point in time is able to expand into new areas of staple production. And by that, I mean tobacco, and sugar, and that's taking place mostly in Brazil and in Cuba. The implication of all this is that this new type of slavery escalates the demand for labor force, which explains the image that we saw about the slave trade in the 19th century. There is a driving demand, a rising demand in the Americas. On the African side, in terms of understanding why the, 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 the magnitude of the slave trade in the 19th century was so large, we have to account for several factors. I would say that there were trading networks linking coastal Angola to the interior in a, in a very, very developed way, very decentralized, this sort of social and commercial dynamic that we don't find in many places in Africa. In addition to that, in order to understand why the slave trade was so large in, between Central Africa, Brazil, and Cuba, 
we have to account for the fact that the slave trade in the 19th century, particularly in that region, is mostly, is primarily what I call a multi-dimensional business. By that I mean that we have not only a trading network, but also we have a set of very complex and tight social and cultural connections between Brazil and Angola. This goes way beyond business. Okay? We're talking about uh, personal relations, transatlantic family connections. They're very strong. And my point is that this dynamic gives the slave trade a significant degree of adaptability in the 19th century. So if the question is, why does it become so big? And why does it last so long? Which in fact, it does last until 1867. We need to look at that, at the slave trade, not only as a business, but also as a multi-dimensional multi activity in which you might have you know, a father that has as a business partner, a father that's located, that's, that's, that's based in Angola, might have as a business father, as a business partner, his own son in Brazil. That's what I mean by this multidimensional uh, feature to the slave trade. Um, to illustrate how unique the South Atlantic was in the, in, 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 in the 19th century, in addition to the growth of the slave trade, we can also consider how the region became, at that time, a battlefield of imperial politics. That's a key change here, a key change that is taking place in, in the 19th century, a turning point, I would argue. And I say that because up until the 19th century, the South Atlantic is really mostly a Portuguese lake. There's not much challenge to Portuguese domination in the South Atlantic. If there is any domination this is, or any challenge, that's coming from another Portug from a Portuguese colony, Brazil. But other than that, you might have uh, the British trying to establish themselves near places like Angola, but it's not, a, it's not a consistent engagement. In the 19th century, however, the situation becomes very different. And this makes for a much more international South Atlantic. We have several new players here. The British are all over the place. They fight the slave trade and they build empires because there is a key connection, as I pointed out before, between abolitionism and colonialism. Brazil goes from being the most important Portuguese colony to become a real major rival of Portugal. This changed the geopolitics in the region in the 19th century. In addition to that, we find American traders, people coming or sailing all the way from New England to Central Africa, which means that if we think of you know, the history of capitalism in the US as a process that's intertwined with slavery, we, think, we should think about that in the broader context of the Atlantic. This is a transnational process. I say that because the technology that drives the slave trade in the 1840s, sometimes the, the funding that drives the slave trade in the, in the 1840s and 50s, Part of it is coming from the US, even crew members on those slave ships. Much, much of this internationalization is a function of abolitionism, which takes much, much longer to gain momentum in the South Atlantic than in the North Atlantic. Why? Because on the Brazilian case, on the Brazilian side, for example, the chronology of abolitionism begins in the 1810s. Okay? That's when they have the first law that you know, tries to put a, a ban on the slave trade. However, it would take 30 years for the struggle against the slave trade in Brazil to pay off in any meaningful way. In many ways, in fact, protecting the slave trade becomes central to, to the political fabric of independent Brazil. It really shapes 
political relations in Brazil as an independent nation. And it is not surprising that the slave trade then lasts into the 1850s. On the Portuguese side, the rise of abolitionism was equally slow. Portugal ended the slave trade from its colonies, a law that's passed in 1836. But this law would not really be implemented or enforced before until the mid 1840s. There's an interesting debate here. Scholars go back and forth on the relationship between ending the slave trade, in the Portuguese case, and the introduction of a new type of colonialism in Central Africa, particularly in Angola. Some argue that Portuguese colonialism was act actually born out of a reflexive and almost ideologic, romantic attachment to Africa. Other people argue that there is clearly a way to pinpoint where the economic rationale of Portuguese colonialism was in the 19th century. My take is th on this is that, and the reality is, that Portuguese abolitionism only picks up momentum after the decolonization of Brazil in 1822. It is with the laws of Brazil that Portugal begins to reconsider its relationship with Angola. From that point on, I would argue that Portuguese abolitionism is driven by at least three strategic goals, all of which imply the end of the slave trade, but the continuation of slavery in Angola. First, there is the Portuguese need to remake the Angolan economy as a plantation economy based on the production of agricultural commodities to Europe. The dream at the time was to recreate Brazil there. The dream was to have a sugar plantation in Angola, a sugar plantation economy in Angola, a cotton production that was, you know, large scale cotton production in Angola. To accomplish this, a position, this position, or the intellectual justification of this new Brazil, of building a new Brazil in Angola, become part of the many, many intellectual uh, work in the metropole in the 1830s and 1840s. Okay. So from the point of view of people, for example, at the Sociedade de Geografia in Lisbon, which becomes a focal point of this intellectual production, it was more than necessary to end the slave trade because the slave trade takes away from Angola the labor force that would be necessary, that would be vital to uh, remodel, to remake the Angolan economy away from the slave trade. An Angolan economy that, again, is based on slavery. Second, Portuguese abolitionism is also driven by the goal of eliminating the ties between Angola and Brazil. Much of the slave trade between Angola and Brazil is not controlled by Portugal at that point in time. Portugal is actually a, a secondary player in this slave trade. Most of this trade is organized from Brazil. As a result of that, in places like Luanda and Benguela, the two most important Angolan cities, the colonial elite is made up of people with deep ties to Brazil by way of birth or because of cultural connections. Those are people that travel all the time across the Atlantic. A degree of um, physical mobility that it is quite impressive. From a Portuguese point of view, there were always questions about the loyalty of these people, this colonial elite in Luanda, the colonial elite in Benguela. The fear was that they were more attached to Brazil than to Portugal. Portuguese sources tell us about racial seditions against the Portuguese. 
racial seditions that sometimes are overplayed by the Portuguese sources. Okay? We take a closer look, it's not really driven by race, but it's driven by animosity. Animosity against a new type of colonialism that's introduced by Portugal. Animosity against this idea of severing the ties between Angola and Brazil. After becoming independent, Brazil develops a foreign policy that was rightly seen as a threat by Portugal. In 1826, for example, the Brazilian government sends three warships to Angola. The goal is to protect the slave trade to Brazil against piracy. That's the formal justification that they give at the time. However, the Brazilian warships go into Luanda, the capital city of Angola, and they refuse to comply with Portuguese regulations about foreign ships in that city. At that point in time, Brazil is an independent nation. At the same time, the Brazilian government sets up a consulate in Luanda in the 1820s, with the Brazilian consul becoming one of the worst enemies of Portuguese authorities in Luanda. In fact, it establishes almost a counterpoint to Portuguese colonial power in that place. This all helps us understand why for the Portuguese was so ending the slave trade, ending the connections between Angola and Brazil was so vital in this process of remaking Portuguese colonialism with the African colony. Another driving force behind Portuguese abolitionism is the intense imperial rivalry competition with the British in the South Atlantic. From the Portuguese point of view, the suspicion was ours that the British would use the campaign against the slave trade to challenge Portuguese sovereignty in that region. That's, that's the fear everywhere. In 1838, for example, Governor of Angola, Manuel Antonio de Noronha, pointed out, and I'm basically quoting him here, the continuation of the slave trade is now improper without exposing our colonies in Africa to British insults and giving them a pretext to enter in direct negotiation with the African neighbors on the coast. And uh, quotation. Imperial rivalry is particularly important in the 1840s, when the British took a series of military actions against the slave trade throughout the Atlantic. This is a time in the 1840s when the British were threatening to bomb Little Popo in the Bight of Benin. It's also the time when they came very close to block Santos in Brazil. It's a military blockage. They are flexing the military muscle, basically issuing threats, pressuring different governments, pressuring different uh, kingdoms through, uh, in Africa to issue uh, deadlines to end the slave trade. The culmination of all this are the actions, the bombardment of Lagos in Nigeria in 1851. And of course, we know that from that point on, it paves the way for 10 or 12 years later for the beginning of official colonialism, British colonialism in Nigeria. So once again, the connection is pretty clear here. From the point of view of the Portuguese, the fear was that this same sort of policy would be applied to Central Africa, that eventually, the British might try to annex Angola. It is in this context in which the Portuguese state saw abolitionism as a tool to develop new ties with Angola and as a tool to fend off the British that Egidio Sebastião and Antonio Joaquim, the two runaway slaves that I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, went to the governor of Benguela, a, a man named Vicente Ferreira Barucho, who was a newcomer to Benguela. 
It's a Portuguese guy who had just recently been assigned to that position in Benguela. They went there, the two runaway slaves, as I pointed out, to denounce the slave trade. What they said, and I want to quote them here, was that a large number of slaves were shackled and about to be sh shipped abroad to Cuba. Those are their words. They also said that they could identify the places and even the names of the slave dealers in Bengala. What they did next was to guide Portuguese forces to the place where those 200 slaves were shackled and being held to be shipped to Cuba. Most of the people there, most of the 200 slaves were children. This action leads or led to an investigation that eventually caused the arrest of several individuals involved in the slave trade. One of the people arrested was a man named Luis Antonio de Souza Monteiro, the manager of the establishment where the slaves had been found, the 200 slaves. According to British representatives in Luanda, Monteiro, and I quote here again, was found hiding in his house on information given by one of his own slaves. So here we find another, another indication of slave participation in this process of abolition taking place in, in Benguela. It is important to say that what the two Africans did, Sebastian and Joaquin, what they did came with great personal cost. After denouncing the slave trade to the Portuguese, the two runaway slaves were actually allowed to stay in the governor's policy, which signals very clearly Portuguese commitment to abolitionism. However, a local judge placed the two men under the care of a well-known Portuguese slave dealer, a man named Joaquim Luis Bastos. By the time the Portuguese officials were able to bring the two African men to Luanda, the capital city of Angola, they had already been victims of torture at Bastos' hands as a punishment for the denunciation of the slave trade. Now, this episode, this incident, raises several fascinating questions. The first one, obviously, is who were Sebastian and Joaquin? Where do they come from? Do, do we have information about them? Another interesting question is, what about Governor Barhunshu, who was very sympathetic to the slaves? To which extent does Governor Barhunshu's actions reflect post Portuguese decision making at the time? Portuguese attitude at the time, to which extent the two runaways uh, slaves' actions reflect broader uh, 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 patterns in terms of African resistance to the slave trade. Can we generalize from this specific case? As for Sebastian and Joaquin, as I said, we lack details about their personal lives but we know that they were part of a much larger slave population in Benguela and the nearby regions. In 1855, for, for example, there were around 2,500 slaves in Benguela and in the vicinity of the, of the city. Most of these people worked on farms devoted to collecting a lichen called Oshela that was used to dye textiles in Europe. That's the economic activity that's replacing the slave trade at the time. So by shipping people like, by shipping the slaves abroad, in fact, the slave dealers are hurting the local economy, which in a way, it explains why Governor Barhunsho was willing to turn against them. In addition to policy making coming out of Lisbon, in addition to the fear that the British could step in and try to take over the place, there is this local dynamic that's important to account for. This is what is also driving 
Portuguese decision making on the spot. Another important question, as I said before, is whether Sebastian and Joaquin's actions are representative of the larger slave population in Benguela. In other words, were there other slaves like them? Slaves who would try to go to Portuguese officials to denounce the slave trade? Should we, should we consider slave resistance as a factor to explain the end of the transatlantic slave trade then? In fact, the evidence indicates that Sebastian and Joaquin's actions fit into a larger picture of slave resistance against the slave trade in Benguela in the 1850s. And this is, I'm going to offer this as a, pretty much as a conclusion to this talk. I will offer three other cases that back up this, this statement that slave resistance plays into the process of ending the slave trade in that city, in Benguela. In 1853, for example, authorities reported that, and I'm quoting here, 50 slaves who belonged to Manuel da Costa Souza, a Brazilian man who used to live in Benguela, had been sent to the vicinity of Benguela to be shipped to Cuba, but that they became suspicious about that, about their fate, and fled. A few months later, a few months after Sebastian and Joaquin went to Governor Barruncho, another runaway slave, and that's my second example here that connects slave resistance to abolition, to the abolition of the slave trade. Another runaway slave, an, a man named Joaquin Innocencio, also denounced that, that a shipment of slaves was about to take place in Benguela. According to Innocencio, the runaway slave, who also went to Governor Barruncho again. He had fled a farm near Benguela because, I quote, he was convinced that he was going to be shipped abroad. The runaway reported that many captives were still held for the slave trade in the place where they had, he had fled from, and that they belonged to several individuals in that city, in Benguela. This case also leads to investigation that deals a blow to the slave trade in Benguela. Many, many people were arrested because of this denunciation. Another case, the third one and final one, takes place in 1860, when over 100 slaves complained to authorities, to Portuguese officials, that they had, and I'm, and I'm quoting here, seen with their own eyes the shipment of slaves that had taken place on a Spanish ship. They then said that they would escape and take revenge on their master because they thought and said that they had no doubt that after many long years of work, they would be shipped abroad. They then revolted, they burned the farm where they used to work, they decapitated the overseer of the farm, and they fled to the interior of Angola. Thank you. We have uh, 15 minutes or so for, for questions, although we have Rokinando here uh, in, in residence, but uh, this is a great opportunity to really ask questions about what is in many ways a kind of an extension of the earlier project and working toward the next one. So the floor is, is open for comments. Yeah, Anusha, then you Thank you so much. I, I would be uh, really interested to hear about how um, these figures of Sebastian Joachim uh, fit into uh, the historiography or the kind of cultural memory of abolition um, in, in Portugal or whether they do it all because I'm thinking comparatively we're in, in a room with an exhibit about the Haitian Revolution of course we have this figure of a, a former slave and this model of slave resistance kind of playing a complicated role in the history of abolition in, in France and so I was hoping um, you might if, if it exists tell us a little bit more about the, that context in the kind of 
So I, I, I think the shortest answer is that they, they, don't, they don't show up in the, in, in, the, in, the, in the collective memory. The reason being that you know, there's very little written about this kind of phenomenon. That's, that's the primary reason. By saying that, I don't mean to imply that in Angola they, they don't have a memory of the slave trade. They have museums, they have monuments, they, they talk about the slave trade. When we go there, they say, look, it's very important that you're writing about the slave trade and connections with Brazil. But the specific case of these two people, these two individuals, and the importance of African uh, agency in the context of, of ending the slave trade, that's not, that's not, doesn't really, it's not, it's not part of the popular imagination. Thank you very much for this fascinating talk. I, was, I wanted to pick up on that final note that you left us with about fleeing to, to the interior and ask about uh, this connection and how you see the connections of Portuguese minds between abolitionism, abolitionism and slavery and abolitionism and the slave trade on, you know, on the other hand. And I ask this because, I mean, obviously the homeland, the Colombo for, uh, for the for these slaves was much closer in Angola than it would have been if you're fleeing into the interior in, in Brazil, and both in a sort of a geographic, very real sense as well as uh, as well as in a juridical sense. So I wonder whether you know these Portuguese official, sort of officials were aware of how much more difficult it will be for them to recreate a Brazil when the homeland is you know just somehow the way. Well, um, that's a very interesting question. I mean, what, what we can say is that there is a very consistent um, policy making in terms of you know, um, fostering uh, sh sugar production in Brazil, that this um, idea of recreating or creating a new Brazil in Africa, it manifests itself also with the creation of a colony in the south of, of Angola. It's, the name is Mossamedes. And the, the, interest, the interesting point about the Mossamedes uh, uh, experience is that the people who set up the colony are Portuguese people who fled Brazil because of anti-Portuguese sentiment in Brazil in the first half of the, of the 19th century. Um, the connection with Brazil, the idea of recreating Brazil, eventually, of course, they move away from that. But I would say that you know, up until the 1860s, at least, that's part of the of the ima political imagination. Okay, that at some point they could uh, redraw uh, the internal boundaries of Angola, and that they could have a thriving uh, plantation economy in different parts of Angola. In the 1860s, in fact, because of the civil war in the U.S., there is a booming cotton production. In, in, in Angola. So at that point in time, it, it does pay off. But the real thing about Angolan economy in the context of this, this new uh, colonialism is really rubber production and rubber trade, and that only comes about in the 1860s. It's much later.
question was about the Portuguese um, runaways, the, the pardoning of the Portuguese, uh, the pardoning of the runaways by the Portuguese and the connections with Portugal. Uh, this is a fascinating question. <clears throat> I don't want to misrepresent your question, but the, the, the question is, you know, why was the, the Portuguese governor as sympathetic, so sympathetic to the runaway slaves? What's really going on here? The picture is very, you know, when you give a talk like this, in, in fact, you're simplifying your, your own work. Portugal and, and um, Portuguese colonialism in Angola has a very strong element of fluidity. Going back to the 18th century, for example, we do find uh, slaves or African slaves who come up to Portuguese officials to file lawsuits and regain their freedom, which is something that's kind of unthinkable. Okay? In the 18th century, we do find Portuguese officials who uh, you know, favor uh, African slaves against slave dealers. So it, it, is, it is fascinating and far more complicated than, than we, we, we imagine at, at, first, at first look. Okay. There's an element of fluidity and accommodation here that is very clearly part of the, you know, the social fabric of this colony. From the point of view of the Portuguese, they don't want the slave trade to take over everything. This is a colony. In order to have a colony, you need to have uh, vassals. That's the name they use it to, to use for, to, to refer to these people. The vassals are the local allies. So one of the commitments on the, on, on, on the Portuguese side was to protect these vassals. Okay. And again, this gives this element of malleability and flexibility that's, that's absolutely fascinating. In the 19th century, I would say that in addition to this, you know, this uh, legal tradition, because this is part of the legal framework of the colony, in addition to that, that is the, this evolution of abolitionism. Okay? There is a specificity here. There is a change over time. And what I mean by that is that in the, in the 1850s, more than ever, it made sense for a Portuguese governor to support African runaways against slave dealers. Now, let me just remind you that the slave dealer in Benguela is gonna be very likely a member of the local elite that might challenge the Portuguese governor. The, the slave dealer in Benguela might be a Brazilian national. Okay? Many of them were Brazilian nationals. Okay? So in, the, in a context in which Portugal is trying to do away with these very strong ties between Angola and Brazil to eliminate the slave trade, to go, to go against these uh, uh, slave dealers, it, it makes sense. Any additional questions? Um, if I can just say a couple, uh, a couple of quick things that um, First of all, I think one of the things that is evident from uh, Hokinaldo's talk is the incredible depth of the archival work that he's done and what may not be so evident um, uh, to in this kind of you know, simplified version uh, is the fact that really nobody has done the kind of uh, painstaking work in um, relatively, if not absolutely, um, unknown archives in Angola than Hokinaudo, uh, and that is something that um, I look forward to seeing in this next project as well in the 19th century, um, the ways in which we recover the, 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 the voices and the appearance of um, figures that are pre have purely, purely stated disappeared from the historical record. Um, the other thing that I will say is that it's extremely encouraging to me um, to see um, and I think very important for this institution to see that the dynamics that were set in motion during the colonial period have an extremely important after effect um, that crosses the boundaries of the time that we normally associate with the end of the colonial period. And it's very relevant and very important um, to have that dialogue with uh, these later historical periods um, to really understand what um, the importance of uh, a collection like this is, but also the importance of constantly putting it into dialogue 
with later periods and later scholarship. So um, with that, um, please join me once again in thanking Rokinaldo for a fantastic <laughs> presentation.